the sea wall, the sea brows, the pier and the docks dock area. But that's what makes it for me. You get sunsets over there, they're fantastic sunsets. I was in, born in 1934 and I grew up at Tuppet Sea Browse. 1929, grew up in Kirkby Street. I, I've mixed with, with all sorts, you know, and yet I prefer here. It was a lovely town when we were kids. Well, I thought I wouldn't leave it, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I was born in Six Bank Lane, Nelson Street, in 1931. It's gone and it was demolished. Well, your classes are down straight if you're born there. I'm born here. I just love Mary Port, always have done now. And, and I've got on with everybody and, you know, I, I think they're nice people, good people, put it that way. I've told you about life down here. I know we had nothing and everybody rubbed along. That's, that's in that late 1930s mind, when uh, there wasn't much going then, was there? And I come from a fishing family. My granddad used to have a share in a, a rowing boat with a bit of a sail on it. And uh, they used to catch fish and, and catch a few fish and come back and uh, everybody shared them. Look at it now, life is so easy now, eh? Good God, it's so easy now. I thought. December 1935, I was born. I could not imagine myself anywhere else. I love grasslet. I think you knew people more because there's, there wasn't as many people in the town. The business people in the town, most of them were local, local people. You probably know the people in the shops, and be more people in the shops would be more familiar with you. And they seemed to all be friendly. The shopkeepers seemed to be friendly anyway. As soon as you walked through the door, how was your mum? Is your nan all right? And that kind of thing. Is your dad still at sea? You know, everybody knew everybody. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to... There was golden, the golden line to start with. There was nothing else that I can remember. There was the golden line first. And then Pot Shop, oh, that was on cor corner of um, Chip and Brow. And then you come over the road from there. Carlton to Carlton the Cinema. Carlton Cinema. Cinema? Oh, uh, <laughs> laugh and scratch. I told you that, eh? Laugh for a night and stretch for a week. That was the Carlton. Uh, well, it was the Carlton and the Empire. That, that, but the Carlton was more modern than the Empire, you know. And I, I think the Carlton used to cater for the younger set. Well, Graves owned both of them. They owned all the cinemas on there, Graves, in them those days. Carlton was nearly always cowboys and, uh, and that sort of thing, you know. And Empire was more... Um, Musical type ones, eh? There's an old fella in, in the Carlton, they called him Dan. He used to look after it uh, when you went in, he took your ticket and tore your ticket in half. If you had a boyfriend who was, uh, was wanting to impress you, he took you to the upstairs. You were in the circle. It was six ones downstairs and nine ones upstairs. If he wanted to impress you, he took you upstairs. Two for the circle, please. The first film I saw. Was that uh, somewhere over the rainbow? Was it, was it, was it, Wizard of Oz. Uh, the Wizard of Oz. That's the first film I saw. And then uh, I also remember the one with Adolf Lewin with uh, Robin Hood. Well, it was just the old films. Carlton Laugh and Scratch. It was dog rough like here. Eh? And kids would get up and start fighting each other in the aisle and 
I'd seen you at school and I'm waiting for you kind of thing. And I'd get out in the bloody hell and I'd start wrestling and fighting, carrying on. Because one went to school and one went to another school, but they, they were arguing about some, and that's where I'm going to find you. They had somebody patrolling, like, when there was a film showing. If, I, if there's any row at all, like, come on, out. <laughs> Carlton, especially one woman, she used to pass my, my crowd. Well, you a lot saying you a lot there. <laughs> Then we'll get back together after the picture started. She just used to part us because we used to laugh and carry on her like you do. And so she part us. And then middle pictures were all back together. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she used to make a big fuss all the time. She'd have torch with a head like that. Big long torch. Um, silver coloured torch with a head like that. There must have been ten batteries in it, you know, under her arm. And she'd come along with this torch and switch it on and then beam! And he'd be like, what are you two up to? Where's your hands? Put your hands on the front, I can see your hands. Oh, sure, my mother will be saying what's going on here. Let me see your hands. <laughs> and everybody's gone, who is it? What's she talking about? Who's she talking about? And then they're standing up and lo looking around, and like, who is it? Who's lads that? Who's that lads in trouble? Can you imagine this going on? And the film's still going on, and these bloody big torches going everywhere, because she's saying, you shut up. You shut up at night, not with you, am I yet? And torches going on everywhere, you know, you know. And everybody wants to know, who's, who's lad is that? And where's his hand? It's in a bra, isn't it? <laughs> and those kind of thing. And she'd do it all the time, five, six, ten times a night with this bloody big long torch. Lil Hayden, there she was. She lived up, she lived in High Street, didn't she, Lil? Yeah. And if she could get the name, she'd shout it out loud. And that, that was it for town, that, a town like ours, you know. I heard about you a lad last night up in Carlton there. Eh? I bothered this lass, I know, I heard about it. You wanted to have a word with you a lad? This, this is exactly how it was here. Eh? <laughs> mm. Just to shine a light along the row. You there? Shush. Or you'll go, you'll go out. <laughs> There was um, one of them windows, maybe, maybe two foot, mm. two foot. If you go to the third one and you open that, and you went in that cubicle, all the kids was waiting outside, one on top of the other, and they'd come in through, through the window, through the cubicle, and you'd look to see, you said, where's that old woman with that torch? Oh, she's up there, you're shouting at them lads. Come on, she's up beyond there with the torch, come on. Six, seven, eight, ten, twelve. Oh, it's cuddling down. Come on in here, there's room along here. And all these kids <laughs> got in pictures for now. When you come to Ghana, she'd say, Where are you lot all come for here? Where are you lot all come for here? Did I give you a ticket? Ah, I did, I'm with my mum. My mum's over there. <laughs> it went on. <laughs> she knew, but she couldn't, couldn't place it. But that was, that was local cinema. Great entertainment, that sort of thing, eh? We, we passed by Ogneys quite quickly. Do you, remember, do you remember going into Ogneys? Oh, Peter's, oh, I. I uh, also went in there for ice cream. Next to, next to Carlton, and used to, used, used to do a roaring trade. Uh, when Carlton had a good picture on, I used to go in there for ice cream first. And uh, Oxos, uh, other different drinks. Oh, that's where I met my wife in there. Ogneys, yes, oh, I, Peter Ogney, father, I... Jet black hair, none on the top, just round the sides. Jet black hair, white, white teeth, brown eyes, and all smiling. He had a nice way with us. I mean, some uh, cafes you go in and, you know, and shout, no, no, carry on. Peter didn't bother, I mean. No. And then, and then I, I can remember he got joke boxing once. I think I did me courting in there, eh? Drinking coffee. <laughs> like, not with Mary. <laughs> and you just went with your friends and had a chatter and a giggle about stupid things. And oh, I used to go there every Sunday. We'd go for a walk and then go in for a Vim tour. Winter, a hot Vim tour, and summer, just a cold one. <laughs> As you got older, you went in and you sat back to back on these seats, you know. And People behind you sat with the back till you and you were talking to them all the time and passing things off and passing things back. 
and uh, maybe it held, uh, let's say, three, six, twelve, maybe about two dozen people altogether, kind of squashy and table in the middle, you know, and uh, you sat there forever. And one of the lasses would come and say, do you want something else? You'd have to have something else, come on. You'd been there a long time on, on a fork near uh, <laughs> Oxford. <laughs> Of course, and the Italians came over in the 1920s, didn't they? Anivazzi and uh, uh, Tognarelli, is that working? Ogni, Peter Ogni. The other influx was from Spain, Cueto. Oh, Mrs. Cueto. Yeah, lovely people. Oh, the Italians were the one that, ones that brought ice cream into the country. Really, weren't they? Oh, yes, I... Albany's Albany's best. Mm. When uh, war was declared, and then Italy joined the, the Germans fighting fighting us, Albany's window was put in. Mm. But he was in he was in turn during the war. Anyway. And they sent him to Isle of Man, Peter Ogney. And then I was he, Italian, yeah. And then he came home and he got a job in the steelworks at Workington. And he was killed in the steelworks. Mm -hmm. I, so. I don't know whether the ring came out or the hook broke. But Peter was working on it. And he got it. It, it backlashed. That was in the Bessemer at uh, Wookin. And he was a lovely man, Peter Ogney. One of the nicest fellows you could have possibly met. And then there was a fish, a wet fish shop. Jackson. Jackson, that's it. Fish and uh, and um, rabbits hanging up. And uh, all hanging along the back. And, and, and fish, a lot of fish and herring and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and it sort of went sloped up, but you know, and you stood there, and, and it was always dripping water around your feet, smelly, fishy water around your feet, because they were always throwing cold water over everything. Did you say Herbert Jackson's father's shop? It would be his father, because it was it was Jackson's anyway, and I can't say Herbert yeah, doing that. Yeah. They educated him. Uh, but he took he took over the shop? From he the did, farm. yeah, he did, I. And slowly but surely, he changed it. Mm. Changed it more to a grocery shop than any other kind of shop. He dropped... Dropped all the fish and uh, and fowl, fish and fowl. It was then, eh? Herbert Jackson and Mary. Yeah, Mary. She was a nice person. School teacher she'd been. Yeah, everybody liked Mary. She was she was accepted kind of thing. You never seen her in the shop, Mary. She seemed to be a very very quiet person, but he was always pleasant in the shop. He had a bit of say in the town. Uh, he wrote two or three books about Maryport and that kind of thing. But he never mixed with anybody, you know. And he had them old funny old pants on, you know. Plus fours. With, with the socks up to his nose. With big crisscrosses on them and big broad shoes and <laughs> coming and going hot. <laughs> he just didn't fit in. They were a quiet couple that got their pleasure out of photographs and writing about about um, Mary Port, you know, which you're finding the benefit of now. Now, the grocer's on the corner. Green grocer, fruit merchant. Aye, fruit merchant, aye. It was uh, Beaky Wilson. Yeah, Beaky, aye. It was a funny old man with a big blue face with veins. Veins all over his face, big nose, bulbous nose, big noisy, on top of you, kind of man. Do you know what I mean, man? By that, overpowering. He was a big man, eh? untidy. Eh? Not as tidy as fruit shops nowadays. Why do they call him Beaky? I wonder, eh? But that's that's a good Beaky Wilson. <laughs> okay, he had to come in and go on that on, I don't mind. One of them that take both ends. A deer stalker they called, really, yeah. That's a proper name. He had one of them on, well-worn. Oh, boxes would be on floor and 
maybe a, a, one a bit higher and no, there was, it wasn't tidy. Oh, and there was no counters and no shelves. No, there was no one floor. <laughs> That's what I can remember, and especially during war when they got us a, a supply of uh, maybe oranges or something like that, because eh, you know, there was a shortage of them. It went, well, wood would get round and shops had been supplied, so you sent you either went or your mum went and stood in queue. Bananas, if there was bananas, everybody seemed to go mad. <laughs> but it was mainly fruit that uh, you'd, uh, when you've got fruit in, you got cows. My mum would always, or my nana, would always give me a shilling. And she'd say, if you see a queue, join it. It doesn't matter what it is the queue and for, join it. And when you come to your turn, if, you, if, you, if they say you're too small, that means it's cigarettes. And tell them that your dad couldn't come out <laughs> He's got a bad leg. <laughs> and you, you're getting cigarettes for your dad. And you take a cigarette home. You know, as many as you could get for a shilling. Usually a packet of wood burn, a wild wood burn. Remember them? Mm -hmm. Wild wood burn. You take them home and, the, and the, that, then the bartering started then. You know, I mean, two cigarettes. What you got for two cigarettes? You know? And I remember once uh, I went to the butcher and uh, I said, uh, my nan says there's five wood burn in this uh, packet. Uh, what you got? He gave us a tin of corned beef. A tin of corned beef, it was great, you know. You could mix stew with it and stew with it and, and mix it up with mashed potato and, and then fry it into patties. And This was Barton that went on in shops, you know. There was a maypole and then Johnson's Cleaners in the just a little way spot, then Woolworths. No, it was home Colonial. Oh, I... Oh, well, it was a grocer's shop. If we didn't sell anything in the home and colonial, what had to be pre-packed? There was bacon, there was gammon, there was cooked ham, I think. And I used to love being on that big baking machine with me. <laughs> when we had to have to clean that, you know. But um, cheese, lovely cheeses. My mum used to say, go and just have a pound of cologne from the home and cologne. We used to laugh how it rhymed, you know. <laughs> I didn't care for it like it. Which used to be for my dad's beard. For my dad's beard, because he, he worked on promenade when they were building promenade. Well, they worked tides there. It was before war, and well, I mean, I vaguely remember because I used to go with my mum to take his, if they're on a night tide, she made me make a can of soap, a broth to check for him, you know. And she loves to go with him, uh, with his, uh, if he's on night tides, and take him somewhat warm to warm them up there. But you just, I think your parents just got stuck in one shop and they just shopped there, eh? My mother was a Roman colonial fan. You know, my auntie, she was a Walter Wilson fan. Like those old shops, uh, shopping from Walter Wilson's. Because I used to do wool shopping as a kid. But I had to go to Walter Wilson's and to get it at home colonial. <laughs> you know, they, they all seem to have their own favourite shop. Well, you had your choice, yeah. And what I used to love doing was pulling the blind out. They always had those. Those blinds that pulled out, you know. They were nearly all, on all photographs you'll have seen them on straight, all the way down. I used to love doing that. Used to sweep the fronts and inside the shop, sweep that out. Oh, I liked it. And I don't know whether I should tell you this or not, but it's truthful. I've scraped more. <sighs> flow bottle eggs of bacon then you could count your your years of age in days even though they were in a freezer they would literally on big wooden table I used to love doing it and then putting them on a piece of tissue paper and squashing them little wiggly little wiggly worms yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, the shop would be shut. Yeah, it would. would, would be. Be... 
would be closed. Yeah. But we're all still here. I don't know of anybody dying of it. Yeah. And I can remember I just got left school at 15. And my first job was in Woolworths, which my cousin got for me, Elizabeth, because she worked in the offices. And so she got me this job in Woolworths, which I liked. Oh, yes, I. Threepence and six, my stores. It was known as. There was nothing, you know, beyond that in price. It, it was a general shop, you know. That if, well, if, if you needed something, you have to say, go to Woolies. Wool was threepence and six in the store, yeah. And all the lasses standing on boxes at the back of the counter. They all stood on boxes with the back to the wall. Now, why did they do that? I suppose so they could look onto the counter there. Eh? Well, it's the first time we'd seen a big store like that, wasn't it? Uh, likes of us. Uh, I mean, there was a, it was all sectioned, wasn't it? Uh, it was. No, they sold all the modern things. Uh, uh, curlers and rollers and hair dyes and uh, toothpastes and that sort of thing. They had all the sweets and chocolates on, build, it sort of sloped up everything onto it. Eh? It was always nicely set out, and mm. you knew which which, which area to go for whatever you wanted. Eh? Oh, it was the biggest, by far the biggest, yeah. Oh, aye. And brightest. Yeah. Brightest as well, yeah. All the lashes wore the same thing. They all thought they were it and all. All the tidy hair and long fingernails, all the... You know, you, you couldn't just walk into Woolworths and get a job. <laughs> I don't know who took them on, but uh, he must have had a bloody good look at them to make sure that uh, they come up to his standard or her standard. We had a big photograph taken on the roof at Woolworths. Mr Lee, he was the manager. It did, did funny how I remember his name, the first job, and he, he was a gentleman. He was what you'd... He was dapper. Dapper, smart, well built. He looked like a gentleman when you seen him walking about the store. And um, so the lovely big canteen, and you could have your lunch there, or just your cup of tea and a biscuit at your ten o'clock. Downstairs there was haberdashery, us on the electrics. There was the biscuits. Oh, there wasn't a lot of sweets in those days. It was just after the war. Ration books. Everywhere you went, you had to take your ration book for food. Oh, we were on what, ration books for about ten years after the war. You know, so there wouldn't be a lot of sweets. There would just be biscuits, and even biscuits, I mean, they went like wildfire when they knew they had broken biscuits in. Then Palmer's Fish Shop, Wet Fish Shop. Do you remember their names? Reggie and Jim Palmer, yeah. Two brothers, yeah. They run fish shop, didn't they? One was a, a stout, big stout fella. And at the back there would gut and clean the fish. I we had rabbits hanging up outside and oh. all. Right old fashioned there. The fellas go and rub it and, you know, we could get it. Sell them rabbits. Rabbit buy them. rabbits off them. They used to buy rabbits and everything. When I was fishing, he once offered me uh, 22 shilling a stone for a uh, skate. Made pot show was alive with stuff. You could have gone down, you could have lived off it. Mm. No kidding, you could have lived off it. And the hill, rabbits. You couldn't know. He had, he had uh, this wet fish shop, yeah, but I can't tell you much about it because I know the business was on the quay. That's where all the women, all the women um, gutted herring and it was put into big bottles. And uh, Palmer's, it was Palmer's business. And he used to send them to Isle of Man and make kippers out of them and that kind of thing. That was his business. You come along, uh, you know the jets uh, on where Willie Poland lives? Uh, you go, it's, there's Willie's and then the blue and white house on the end. Well, they bought Palmer's yard and they vaulted it all. But it was there, past that house. Now, there's a, a blue door a blue and a lovely garden. Well, that was a blue door, but it had a big fan and it said uh, Palmer's Limited. 
on it and up and down, blue and white, blue and white, blue and white, a big, double, enormous door. I was quite busy, it was farmers, yeah. Oh, we used to get the fish and, and uh, put them under thing, this big thing on the sticks there. Uh, and they used to put the um, shavings in the bottom and then set fire to the shavings and the smoke used to smoke go them, away. Yeah. They used to go to pictures of a night, those lassies and folks would say, oh, it's them herring lassies, I can smell them herring lassies from here. I suppose it was in the hair and everything really. Yeah. It doesn't matter how old they were, how young they were, they all put a coarse brat, they called it a coarse brat on, and a pair of clogs or old wellies or something, and the gutted fish. They had their own special knives, and uh, a bit of red sandstone, and uh, the, it was a good old bent in the middle where they'd uh, gutted, you know, but sharpened them all the time, and, and look at these herring, fast walkers. He was good with them, he paid them, and they wanted paid daily as well, I remember because they couldn't wait a week for money. They wanted it daily. And uh, they were paid according to the hour and, and how many barrels and that sort of thing, you know. So the shop was secondary to to what they did. Uh, and, and the fact that they helped so many people in Maryport and they bought the fish and all from the lads as well, uh, which was good. Well, then, then there was the Empire. You'd just be with your... Your girlfriends there, eh? two or three girlfriends, and then the lads would be there, and and if lasses fancied anybody, they'd be trying to get sat down where they were sitting, where they were sitting at. You you could go to Carlton wearing anything you liked; it didn't matter. But the Empire, no, you dressed to go in the Empire. That was a posher one. That was all um, fancy fretwork at the sides, looked like castles, all fretwork and the and the. Red velvet and nice big facade going up the stairs to the big wide, wide steps to the balcony, to the top floor. Ooh, you felt good there. Mm. You even talked posher when you were going in there. <laughs> Carlton was a lot smaller than the Empire. It um, Empire was wider. You went up in the, in the gods in the balcony, oh, it was great, that. And then come along with ice cream on a tray, with a flashlight, sell your ice cream, six months for a ice lolly, ice cream. Some old bugger would come back later with his great big torch, <laughs> carrying a cell on. So Dick Hutton, all Dick has recorded him, he was at Empire. Oh, and he used to bang that stick, if you carry on in pictures, bang stick. Uh, any morning you've been getting put out. A, like a wooden partition where he went in and he was bang it on there if you're carrying on, you know, <laughs> just bang it, tell it to be quiet. The Empire at the back for courting couples. I was never lucky enough to get on one of them. <laughs> there were just double seats like this sofa. It was all one with an handle on each side, an arm on each side. Well, if you've seen anybody fresh that was caught and you used to be, you'd be looking to say, oh, look who they're going with now. <laughs> Nauseam. <laughs> Went to both of them, Carlton and the Empire. Uh, if you walked it out, you could gargle one every night, but there's only one night you, you couldn't gargle them over. Monday, Carlton, Tuesday, Empire. Went to Carlton, Thursday, Empire, could have changed. Monday went to Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. It changed and, and you could go every night. So every other night you went there, could nothing else to do except go to pictures. Uh, you could go to the first house and then would come out or go to the second house or something good on there, you know, if you had money. <laughs> you went to everything like that because it was entertainment, eh? It was only the radio, other than that, there wasn't any entertainment. Oh, Jeanette MacDonald and Nelson Edda, you know, I can remember them. Of course, my father and mother used to go to them, you know. I mean, they went to pictures at the, the Athenaeum, they called it in uh, High Street. But me, Jeanette, my father and mother used to say, when I was born, they'd been to Athenaeum, and Jeanette MacDonald and Nelson Eddy were on, and that's where my name was supposed, because they didn't know what to call us, oh, we just called Jeanette, so. That's the crack they used to tell us there, whether they were kidneys or what, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I just took it to, to me right, yeah. And then Crohn's Eye, that was a gent's shop. And, well, boys' cl uh, clothes. Crohn's Eye. That was gentlemen's outfitters. Were you a gentleman? Did you ever get to go? <laughs> oh, I guess I, I used to buy me tackle there. Oh, there was a good shop. It was a good shop, that. So it was a classy, it was a man, just a man's shop. But it was a, a classy man's shop. My brothers, uh, younger uh, William and Thomas, my mother always bought their clothes, as so would say. Well, kids, eh? Uh, there. Well, you've had one or two things at Crohn's, haven't you? Oh, aye. Mm. Yes, I used to go. Aye, me, it, was, it was kind of a clutch shop, you know. It was a nice it? shop. It was nice a nice shop. fellow, Wilf Brinicom, eh? Well, oh, it aye. was a nice man. Crohn's. Wilf Brinicom, they called him. I think his wife was a Crohn, I'm not sure. Very smart man. Very smart, always smart. I was always very smart. Mm -hmm. I, th I played piano, didn't I, for yeah, amateurs? Something like that. It had a lot to do with Mary Port Amateurs and all. Mm. Wilf, I'm nearly sure he organised it. He played the piano and I'm nearly sure he conducted orchestra, a oh, bit of orchestra. Yeah. And there were local singers. Frank Williamson was always the tenor of the singer and Raby Boyd was always the female singer. They were great singers there. Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't have missed amateurs. Every year they put a show on there. Yeah. Rosemary, they've done. Desert Song, I always remember Desert Song, I, I loved it, yeah. And we put, they put it on for a full week and it was always full. Oh, and it was always yeah. held in the Empire yeah, Cinema. Do you have a programme or anything from one of the performances? No, I haven't. No? I couldn't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> Crohn's Eye, that was below the Empire, yeah. And then, ah, there was Lipton's. And then you went to Harrison's show shop. And then there was Craig's on bottom of Centre Street. They Martin, sold everything, Craig's. And, shop. and then you went downstairs for toys. And your wallpaper and pen to sent that. They sold clothes, sold household towels and all such as that. Sold everything, Craig's. And it was quite a big shop. They had, you know, I wouldn't say they had elaborate clothes and that. You know, maybe jumpers and cardigans and I think you'd maybe have even got shoes there, but not, you wouldn't have gone in for a, for anything special, you know, but it was a good run-of-the-mill shop. Oh, I can picture him, he was a tall and good-looking guy, and, and evil in the cold, door. I was born 34, and I, I was at school 39, and I got my school clothes there. So I was there quite a long while, I was Evelyn. I owned her husband, yeah. She mainly run it, yeah. sometimes he, he was there, sometimes he wasn't there. She mainly run the shop. And you got Evelyn Craig and... Uh, Offer her some uh, clothing coupons instead of money. You could barter with Evelyn any time. You, you could use them like cigarettes. They were two of the big things. It was a popular shop when I was a kid. The old shop had never been done up, and you could smell damp and must as you walked there, but you could with most of them tell you the truth. It smelt musty and damp. <laughs> there you go.